Good morning again, everyone. It's always good to look out and see the smiling faces and the bright eyes of my Damascus family. And I have to say, I'm really looking forward to January when I can stay with you all full time, you know. Amen. Yeah, that's, that's the amen moment, hopefully. Right? <laughs> Better than the old mercy moment, you know. And so, you know, I'll be preaching at Body God. So, of course, we'll be preaching here uh, this month once and the next month once. But beginning in January, I'll be here full time. And so for that, we all give God. Yeah, amen. There you go. You got it, Frank. You're my favorite right now. You're my favorite right now. Now, that's true. I do have a favorite list. But to be honest with you, it's, it's a fickle list. It changes all the time. So if you're ever at the top, don't get too arrogant. You can go to the bottom really quickly. Well, today it's good to look out and to see every single one of you. And as Edna said, I hold you each in my heart. And I thank you again for the opportunity to stand before you and to feed your souls with the life-giving power of God's holy word. You may recall that a few months ago we entered into a new sermon series that we were calling Gearing Up for Battle. And in the first sermon we learned that we are in the middle of a great war, a war that we call the Great Controversy. We learned that this war began in heaven, is spilled out onto the earth, and once Satan and his minions got here, They did everything they could to destroy the things that God loves. And that mainly included them destroying the church and specifically looking to destroy the Seventh-day Adventist movement. In our second sermon, we looked at how dangerous this war really was. We took a look at Ephesians chapter 6, which says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This is verse 12, but we wrestle against the spiritual forces of darkness. And that Greek word there for wrestle referred to hand-to-hand combat between two soldiers where they would battle it out and only one of them would walk away. We learned in that sermon the war is real, the war is close, the war is personal, and the war is very dangerous. But praise the Lord, we also learned in that sermon that no matter how dangerous the war could be, It is a war that we can win. Because God said to us in verses 10 through 11 of Ephesians 6, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And in today's sermon, we pick up from there. How do we stand against the devil? How do we put on the armor of God? Today, you and I get to look at how can we gear up for battle. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we invite your spirit to be with us again. We know that we are in battle with a cosmic and powerful foe. But we know, Lord, that he is a foe that has already been defeated. And he was defeated by you when you wore your armor. And so we pray, Lord, that you would teach us today, how can we put on the armor of God? How can we cinch ourselves up with that belt of truth so we do not fall sway to the lies of the devil? Lord, teach us your truth, for your truth will set us free. This we pray in your Son's beloved name. Amen. Probably one of the most famous stories from the modern era is L. Frank Baum's wonderful classic, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. For those of you who may not know this story, very simply is the story of a girl named Dorothy and her little dog Toto, and how one day they are sucked up by a tornado and transported off to the land of Oz. Well, when they get to the land of Oz, Dorothy learns that if she wants to go home, All she needs to do is go down the yellow brick road, make her way to the Emerald City, and there talk to the man called Oz. And when she speaks to Oz, he will grant her what she wants, and she will be able to go home. Well, as the story unfolds, Dorothy makes friends with several people along the way. She makes uh, friends with a scarecrow. 
uh, a tin woodsman and a cowardly lion. And together the four of them make their way toward the Emerald City. Now everybody in this land's heard about the Emerald City. Apparently it's one that's glorious, brilliant, beautiful, and completely radiant. And as they get close to the Emerald City, a battalion of guards meets Dorothy and her friends at the gate. She asks if she can go in, and the guards say, no, 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 you can't go in yet. You see, the city is too brilliant. The city is too radiant. The city is just too beautiful. If you go in the way you are, you will be struck blind. The only way you can enter the city is by putting on these glasses. You need to put on these green tinted glasses because they will protect you from the radiance of the city. And so the four of them, of course, put on these glasses and they make their way into the Emerald City. And as they look around, Dorothy sees that everything people have said is true. The whole city is green and it's beautiful. The buildings are green, the shops are green, the lemonade's green, even the people are green. Because the splendor of the city was so bright that just reflected off of them. Well, later in the story, Dorothy finally appears before the great and powerful Oz. And as she appears before him, her little dog Toto starts to run amok. You see, he gets scared. He starts to run through the throne room. And so Dorothy goes to, to bring her dog under control. And as she picks up Toto, he knocks the glasses off of her face. Immediately terrified, she goes to put her, her hands to her face because she knows that to look upon the beauty of the city, she'll be struck blind. But it's actually as the glasses come off, she does not go blind it's actually as the glasses come off that she sees the truth for the first time. Because as she looks around her, she sees that the city is not green. The city is not beautiful. The city is not full of splendor. She is just surrounded by everyday stone, dingy, dirty, disgusting, common day stone. And that's where Dorothy realized for the first time, she got the first clue that all of them were being deceived. She was deceived by what was before her because she was looking at the world with the wrong glasses. And brothers and sisters, I want to submit to you this morning that we also wear our own green-tinted goggles. And these glasses were not given to us by a friend of ours, no. These glasses were given to us by a foe. All of us have been given the green tinted glasses of Satan's deception. He seeks to deceive you and I in regards to who God is. And he seeks to deceive us in accord to what God has really said. And if we are not careful, we can look at the world through the lens that Satan has given us rather than looking at the world through the lens of God. As we continue to go through the armor of God this month and in December, and finishing up in four weeks in January, you may be prone to ask yourself the question, why are there so many pieces of armor that I need to put on so I can stand against Satan? And the answer is actually simple. Satan does not come at you with only one attack. He does not only use a jab. Satan comes at you from multiple angles. And God knows this. And so our Father has carefully crafted each piece of armor so that he can counter a specific tactic of Satan. And if you want to know what God is guarding you against, then all you gotta do is look at the armor he created and you know what attack of Satan you are being protected from. And so when we come to look at this piece of armor today, we see that God commands us in Ephesians 6.14 that we are to fasten on the belt of truth. It indicates that God is protecting us from one of Satan's most favorite tactics. 
He is protecting us from the green tinted goggles of Satan's deceptions. You know, Jesus said a lot of nice things about people, but I never saw him say something nice about the devil. <laughs> And when it came time for Jesus to tell us and warn us about Satan himself, Jesus says these words in John 8, 44 about Satan. He says, Satan was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he is speaking his native tongue. The Greek says that when he talks, he is fluent in his language, right? Now, I've heard people speak French or Spanish or German, and they're fluent in their language. I find it so beautiful. Do you want to know what language Satan is fluent in? He's fluent in lying and deception. When he speaks, he is speaking his native language. For he is a liar, and he is the father of lies. Some of the versions of the Bible, if you use maybe the ESV or the NLT, will say that he is speaking from his character. At the core of his being, Satan is a lying deceiver. If he is the one talking to you, you can trust me, he is lying. Satan can't do anything but lie to you. Satan's favorite thing to do is to lie to you. Satan loves to lie, and Satan loves the lie. Because Satan knows just how powerful a lie can be. We must never forget this, brothers and sisters. In this war that we call the Great Controversy, the primary battleground is inside your mind. This is where Satan wants to get you. Because if Satan can break you here, if Satan can deceive you here, if Satan can get you here, he can corrupt everything else in your life with a matter of ease. If we have one fundamental error in regard to who God is, and if we have one fundamental error in regard to what God says in his holy book, then it will have catastrophic consequences for our lives later on down the road. At my house, every Sunday, we, we have family time with each other. It's four hours that I block out in my schedule to spend with my family. Right, Michael? We spend family day together. That's right. And it's our time to love each other, to focus on each other, to pour love into each other. If we miss family time, Michael will remind me that we missed it. He'll cash it in, okay? That's how important family time is at our house. Well, just this past week for family time, we took the boys outside our house to go on their scooters. And outside the house where we live in our community, it is the perfect little hill for two perfect little boys to ride down on their little scooters. It is just a gentle slope of a sidewalk. It is a straight shot. You, you just got cars here. You got yards there. It is just the perfect little hill that they woo, go all the way on down to enjoy their time on the scooters. Well, this last week they were playing and they were enjoying themselves. But in the uh, midst of play, Matthew left his scooter at the top of the hill. He ran all the way down and began to play with Michael. But as boys are wont to do, he wanted his scooter back. And so he yells up several hundred feet, Dad! <laughs> Not Mama, Dad! I want my scooter. And in this moment, we have a problem. Because you see, he's too lazy to come up and get it. And I'm too lazy <laughs> to bring it down and give it to him. And so doing what any father, I think any father would do in the moment, I concoct a plan. There is a way we can both get what we want. He can get his scooter. I can stay up here. I can keep sitting by my beautiful wife and everything will be good. And my idea was very simple. I was going to take his scooter. I was going to angle it just so precisely to aim right at him. And I was going to push it. Okay. And it was just, it was perfect. It was just, it's like bowling. You just, <laughs> poof, gutter ball, right? So I got it. I aim it right at him. 
I just push it. And like not even seven seconds later, it goes off in someone's yard. Thank you, Jesus, they just moved out. <laughs> Got it back. Okay. Well, obviously it went to the right, so what do I now have to do? I'm going to angle it a little bit to the left. So I angle it to the left. And... Right in the parking lot. Well, that's not good. Now I'm already halfway down the hill, right? My laziness isn't working here. So I get the, get the scooter again. And... Now I can't go all the way to the right because that puts it in the yard. I can't go all the way left because it puts it in the parking lot. And so I aim right between the two of them. And I push it into a tree. What was wrong? What was I doing wrong? The, the idea was good. It was a good idea. It was a good idea. Amen. Let's try this again, okay? What went wrong? It was a good, it was a good idea. Oh, okay, guys. Maybe y'all don't think it's a good idea. Then. That's okay. That's okay. What went wrong? Very simple. By being off just a few degrees in the beginning had catastrophic consequences later on down the road. Quite literally, in this point, it's the same thing with Satan. If Satan can get you off just a few degrees on the fundamentals in the beginning, it will have catastrophic consequences for you later down the road of life. Now, of course, he knows this. He's a conniving serpent. And so he focuses his attention on trying to get you to break you in two similar areas. He wants to get you to doubt who God really is. And he wants to get you to doubt what God really says. And the white speaks to that first one about getting us to doubt who God is. She says in Steps to Christ, page 10, paragraph 3, Satan led men to conceive of God as a being whose chief attribute is stern justice where you can almost see the old guy in the sky clenching his hand right as she's writing this one who is a severe judge a harsh exacting creditor satan pictured the creator as a being who is watching with jealous eye to discern the errors and mistakes of men that he may visit judgments upon him is that really who our God is? When the Bible says God is love, is that what it's talking about? No, of course we know this. We, we know that's not who God really is, but it's exactly the way that Satan wants you to see him. Even this morning in my teen Sabbath school, we looked at a meme that was on Facebook, how it painted God as this vindictive, cruel, completely bonkers kind of God. So we may know that's not who God really is, but Satan has successfully deceived many people into seeing God as exactly that. But I would submit to you that if we're not careful, Satan can also get us to have a wrong image of God. No, he, he may not be able to convince us that God hates us and is there in stern judgment, but he can convince us that God is not completely a God of love. Yes, he can forgive me the first five times I do this sin, but not the sixth, not the tenth, and certainly not the hundredth. <laughs> That's how Satan wants you to see God. He does not want you to know the perfect love of God that casts out all fear of judgment. And so he comes to you in whatever way he can to deceive your image of God. And he primarily does, does that by the second thing. Not only deceiving you about who God is, but by deceiving you regarding what God says. In Genesis 3, verse 1, Satan literally performed a military coup and took down the entire human race with four simple words. Did God really say did God really say? The moment he does that to you, and he does it to you all the time, did God really say that in the Bible? The moment he removes the Bible from your mind is the moment he removes from you the ability to be moral. You lose your sense of morality. 
He is able to shear and sear, I meant those, both of those words, your conscience. He is able to take you down. Oh, that does not need to be there anymore. He can take you down a destructive road and ultimately break your life. And all he needs to do is use four simple little words. Did God really say? If Satan is the one talking to you about God, or he is the one talking to you about the Bible, then you can trust me, he's lying. But it's by coming to you in these two ways that he is able to destroy your life. Okay, so we know that. We know the war we're in. We know what Satan is trying to do to us. Okay, pastor, we get it. So how can we fight it? How can we stand for truth? How can we stand for what God wants us to stand for and resist the wiles of the devil? If you want to remove the green-tinted glasses of Satan's deception, then you must obey God and stand therefore fastening on the belt of truth. It is truth and truth alone that dispels the darkness of deception. Jesus, as we heard earlier, said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you are to be free from Satan's lies, then you need an objective standard of truth from outside of yourself by which you can measure, is this right or is this wrong? When I was a kid, my mother for some time worked as a bank teller at the local bank. And but this is a little bit, actually really much before the, a lot of the digital age. I don't even think even debit cards were a thing when this was happening. But for my mom's job, a lot of what she had to do was receive and uh, give out large sums of money. And whenever she would do that, right, for those of you who had to go into the bank, you know what it's like. You deposit one, two, three. They count everything out in front of you. But part of my mom's job is as she counted out that money was to lay all the $100 bills aside. Because the moment she laid them aside, she had to do something special with them. She had to hold them up to a light. Because if that $100 bill was the, the real thing, a special strip would show up on the left-hand side. But if it was fake, then nothing would change. Now, my mom was in that job for years. She went through thousands of $100 bills in a single day. It did not matter how many $100 bills she saw. It did not matter how many $100 bills she felt. It did not matter how many $100 bills went into her hands and into the hands of others. Every single time to know if it was real or fake, she had to hold the bill up to the light. And so it is with you and I in our daily walk with God. Throughout your life and throughout your day, you are being bombarded by ideas that are true and ideas that are false. How are you to tell the difference between the two? Do we lean on our own understanding? Do we trust our feelings and our preconceptions? Or do we take every thought, every ethic, every idea, every political opinion, and do we hold it up to the light of truth? I submit to you that's exactly that second thing that you and I must do. With every thought, every desire, every hobby, no matter what it is, the only way you and I can know if it's right or it's wrong is if we hold it up to the light of God. And exactly what is that light? It is the light of Jesus' teachings as found in what we call the Holy Bible. With absolutely no shame and with no fear, Jesus proudly proclaimed to each and every one of us, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. Life, I'm sorry, life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, this is not politically correct to tell you this, but Jesus has the monopoly on truth. Okay, not Confucius, 
Not Buddha, not any other religion, not Islam, not the New Age movement that's growing, not the Republicans, not the Democrats, not the independents, independents, not the independents. They don't have a monopoly on truth. Jesus and Jesus alone is the standard of all truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' teachings are a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And if we did not have the light of his holy word, we would be forced to lean on our own understanding. Come on, brothers and sisters. When we look through our lives, when we look through history, how's that really gone for us? (laughs) Not so good. We need the objective standard by by, by which we may tell what is right and what is wrong. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 5.13 that when anything, any idea is exposed to the light, the truth or the lies become visible. Are you holding everything to the light? Are you taking every thought, every desire, every feeling, every truth claim, every ethical belief, every political issue, and the whole host of other things of your life, and are you comparing them to the light of God's word? Or are you listening to CNN or Fox News? Or maybe you go all the way to the left and go and read Vox. Or you go all the way to the right and you go with Ben Shapiro and Dennis Prager. Where are you getting your lens of truth? Because I want to tell you, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, if you're not getting your truth from here, to a degree, you're going to be deceived. Are you willing to be brave enough to test everything you think to the holy light of God's word? Because it's only as you do this, brothers and sisters, that you will take off the green-tinted glasses that Satan has given you And you will finally walk in the truth. Jesus says, sanctify us by your truth, for your word is truth. And as you compare everything you hold dear to what this Bible says, you will find that the lies and the deceptions melt away, and you'll be walking on the clear path of God. It is no accident, brothers and sisters, that Jesus calls this truth the belt of truth. Truth must be our foundation. It must be the thing that holds all of us together. When Paul wrote about the armor of God, he knew that people in their minds would picture a Roman soldier. And I praise the Lord for this next thing, but we don't have soldiers just walking up and down our streets, okay? Yes, we have you know, the police. It's obviously a very different thing. But we don't have you know, um, peacekeepers walking around with assault guns making sure that you kowtow to what the government is saying. And praise the Lord that we do not have that. And Lord, please help us not get that anytime soon. But Rome had that. And every citizen walked around. And on every street corner... In every metropolis, if they had bus stations then, it probably would happen there too. They saw the soldiers keeping order. They knew the armor that the soldiers wear very well. So when Paul compares the armor that we wear to what the soldiers wore, they understood exactly what he was doing. And when he said compare, that we need, so when he compared truth to having a belt, everyone understood that truth must be our foundation. Let me explain to you. A Roman soldier was fully decked out like an armored tank. Their armor altogether weighed about 70 pounds. Now, I've been backpacking for a few weeks with 30 pounds and 35 on my back. That's hard enough. Imagine living every day with an extra 70 pounds on you. In order for them to carry the pressure of that weight, not only did they have to worry about that weight just while they walked, but they also had to worry about that weight when they took someone to jail, when someone wrestled against them. And God forbid they had to go in battle. They had to deal with the pressure of battle along with the pressure of the armor. And the way it was, if they were not careful, the Roman soldier would completely buckle under the weight. 
How then did they stand? By cinching up inside their armor the Roman belt. The when we think belt, we, we think something, something like this, right? Nice buckle, comes on too good, not too tight, not too loose, holds the pants up just right, okay? That's how we think of belts. That is not the belt they are talking about. Have you ever seen someone come to your house to move and they got that really ugly looking black vest that they just they, they put right here for the extra support in the middle? That's the kind of belt we're talking about here. It is strength at the core and the foundation of who you are. And Paul is saying that if you are going to stand against the pressure of Satan's lies, both during the day and when you go in a spiritual battle, you need to cinch up at your core the foundation of truth. It is truth that will allow you to stand against the pressure of lies. It is the truth that will give you the support to get through your day. Only when truth becomes your foundation will you be able to hold everything else together. How often in the day do you take to cinch up your foundation with the truth of God's word? I'm not going to ask for any specific numbers. Only you know. 10 minutes? 30 minutes? An hour? Three hours? I don't know. But if you are only cinching up the truth in your life for five minutes, and then you go the other 23 hours and 55 minutes of the day hearing constant lies being told to you by Satan, can you be sure that what you think you know is really true. Because I can guarantee you, if that's the way life is for you, there are some things slipping through the cracks. Are you cinching up the belt of truth in your life and allowing God's word to be the foundation upon which you stand? So as I prepare to bring the sermon to a close, I want to let you all know you all can't see this. But I have a clock right there that tells me how long I have left in my sermon. Ain't that pretty cool? Oh, good, no one said amen. Praise you, Jesus. <laughs> See, I was, talk, I was talking to Andrew. No, my, my kid can't say amen. Shush, 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 shush. I was talking to Andrew, and I asked him, I said, you know, Andrew, all of my churches want different lengths of sermon. I said, and, and I gravitate between them, but if I'm not careful, it can get long. I want you to do me a favor. Can you put a clock up for me at the screen? Don't look at that, Mervyn. Can, <laughs> can you put a clock up right there for me so I can see how long I have left on my sermon? He said, well, the problem that if we do that, though, Pastor, it, it might project up to the screen, and then everybody else would see it, too. <laughs> like, oh, you can't have that, can you? Hey, look, honey. Pastor's only got seven more minutes, you know? This is good. Honey, you're supposed to end 10 minutes. I'm docking your pay. So as I go to close this sermon in the next two minutes, <laughs> how can you make sure you're cinching yourself up in the Bible truth? One of the things the elder team and I would like to do this year is give you practical steps of how to implement your faith into your life. Not just ethereal, go and you do this and hopefully things go good for you, but tangible, actionable things by which you can stand on the word of God. I have four of them for you today. Number one, and you can pick from any of these four. I hope you choose all four, but pick one of these four for this week. This week, saturate yourself in the Bible. Dive into it like the ocean. Look, you don't need to live in the kiddie pool that most of us are in. There's a whole ocean of God's wisdom and he wants you to dive in head first. Wake up in the morning. Read some of your Bible. Go ahead and put on the headphones if you're like me. You're getting the kids ready. You're getting ready. Listen to the Bible on the, in the Bible app or on audio. I, I, I tell you, commit yourself to a Bible reading plan. We got one coming up just next year, right, John? We got one coming up. 
You can commit to a Bible reading plan that you may read the whole Bible in a year. And by doing this, brothers and sisters, you begin to saturate yourself in the Word of God. Read it. Follow a plan. Listen to it. Barry Black, uh, in the Advent, uh, right, the SDA, cha- uh, the chaplain to the Senate, he is a Seventh day Adventist, goes to the Bible four times a year just because he listens to it on audio in DC traffic. If he can get through it four times a year just going through traffic, I'm pretty sure we can at least get through it once. Saturate yourself. Number two, this is what I like to do. I don't do as much anymore, but I used to carry around a scripture card. Just one scripture. Two or three verses, right, baby? I used to have them on, uh, on a, uh, a ring. I used to memorize them. At random points of the day, pull out your card and read what God says to you. How does that apply to you in this moment? How is that working in your life right now? Can you pray to him about what you find on the card? Confess to him about what you find on the card? Praise to him about what you find on the card. You're really getting fired. <laughs> Number three, fratsum, fratsum, Andrew. <laughs> Number three, take something that you hold dear, like an ethic or an issue that you're hearing about today, and go and see what the Bible has to tell you. What is the Bible, and no amens and no mercies, what does the Bible have to say about immigration? environmental issues, gay marriage, gun rights, capital punishment, personal liberty, women's ordination, LGBTQ. What does the Bible say? Because I can tell you this, if, if you're listening to Satan on any of these things, trust me, he's lying. And I guarantee you, if you're getting your news from CNN or Fox News or any of the other ones out there, it's not the same as the Bible. I don't care what Fox News says. I don't care what Trump says. I don't care what Biden says. I care what God says. Are you buying into what society is saying about these issues? Or are you looking at what the word of God has to say about these issues? Lastly, I challenge you to remember 1 John 5.19. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. He uses Every movie you watch, every podcast you download, every video game you play, every book you read, every person you talk to, every single thing, listen to me, has an agenda it wants to push on you. Are you comparing that agenda to the word of God? Brothers and sisters, these are four good ways for you this week to cinch up, cinch up the belt of truth. And by doing so, you will not just buy into what the world says. You will be converted by what God says. Everyone who then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Are you founding your world on the rock of God's truth? I pray that you are, brothers and sisters, because right now we are fighting a war. We are in the middle of battle, and it's time for us to cinch up that belt of truth, and only by doing so and standing on the words of Jesus will you and I survive the storm that Satan is throwing our way.